Okay, well, good evening and welcome to this virtual author talk with Valeria Luiselli. This program is being presented in English and Spanish and uh, with simultaneous interpretation by Luis Lopez, who will now go over how to utilize this feature. Luis? Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, this program will be, as uh, Sarah Linda said, um, provided with uh, simultaneous interpretation. So when English is being spoken, if you're not bilingual in uh, about a half a minute after I'm done with this explanation, you will see that there's an icon of a globe that shows up at the base of your screen. If you click on the globe, you can activate interpretation and choose English as your uh, selected language. And then you'll be able to hear when Spanish is being spoken, you'll be able to hear the uh, interpretation into English. Uh, there will be some readings of passages that will be done both in English and Spanish. So during that, we will just, I will, you will not hear the interpretation because if it's a piece that's read in Spanish, it will be followed by the same piece in English and vice versa. Um, thank you very much. And I will repeat the same instructions in Spanish. Buenas tardes, buenas noches. Eh, soy Luis López, su intérprete, y vamos a estar ofreciendo interpretación simultánea de inglés a español y español a inglés. En un momento, cuando termine de la explicación, de dar la explicación, verán que en su pantalla aparecerá un globito en la parte de abajo donde tienen los otros iconos, o si es por teléfono, está en la esquina eh, inferior de su pantalla cuando toquen los tres puntos, tienen la opción de language interpretation o interpretación de idiomas. Eh, elijan español y simplemente pueden seguir escuchando. Cuando se habla español en la sala principal, oirán ese audio directamente. Cuando se habla inglés, escucharán mi voz interpretando el español sin tener que tocar ningún otro botón. Y sí que habrá lecturas de un par de pasajes y esas se van a leer en inglés y luego en español y otra en español y luego en inglés. Así que durante ese periodo no habrá interpretación porque se podrán escuchar las dos, eh, una detrás de la otra. Muchas gracias y adelante. All right, let's go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luis. Uh, and uh, just a note um, that your microphones have been muted upon entry, but you can control your video. And to everyone in the audience, we invite you to type your comments and questions in the chat throughout the program. And we are just so welcome, uh, so, so happy to welcome you here this evening. And we are truly excited to welcome author Valeria Luiselli, who will discuss her 2017 book, Tell Me How It Ends, an essay in 40 questions. The book tackles Luiselli's experience volunteering at an immigration court in New York City, where she translated the responses migrant children gave to the questions that stood between a return to their home country and the promise of a new life in the United States. She will read from her work and following uh, an interview with Viridiana Garcia Choi, our manager of youth and family programs, respond to questions from you, the audience. Luiselli was born in Mexico City and grew up in South Korea, South Africa, and India. An acclaimed writer of both fiction and nonfiction and winner of a MacArthur Genius Award. She is the author of the essay collection, Sidewalks, the novels, Faces in the Crowd, The Story of My Teeth, and Lost Children Archive. Tonight's program has generously been supported by Art Bridges and is in conjunction with Border Cantos, Sonic Border, Richard Mizrach, Guillermo Galindo, an exhibition which is on view at the Hudson River Museum through May 9th of this year. Key to its spirit and timeliness are the issues spotlighted in Tell Me How It Ends and Lost Children Archive. It is particularly relevant to Yonkers, which is a city of immigrants with its large and vibrant Latinx community. And now, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to my colleague, Beauty Choi, HRM Manager of Youth and Family Programs, who will introduce our esteemed guest, Beauty. Welcome everybody and welcome Valeria Luiselli. It's an honor having you here today. And I just wanna mention that uh, a few years ago, uh, since I met your artwork, your artwork, I mean your books, and I read the, your books, like your beginner's book, like um, 
papeles falsos, the story of my feet, uh, sidewalks. And then I, I found this amazing book, Los Niños Perdidos, that is Tell Me How It Ends in, in, in uh, the version in, in English. Uh, uh, and I came here to HRN, I just figured we have to bring this outdoor to this museum because we have this excuse with the border cantos exhibit. And this is the perfect timing to talk about migration, but also approach the subject about what is the crisis with the children and who are like the most, um, a, a, who has been like most, a, a, painful stories that we can find in, in the migration process between Mexico and United States. So I just want to mention that I am the Youth and Family Programs Manager at the Hudson River Museum. And I, I uh, train like um, junior docents who are volunteers. Uh, those junior docents, 30% of them are migrants. And I just want to mention when I get here, I got here to the HRN, we, I have a, I heard a story from a junior docent who was, who was like 16, 15 years old. And the first thing he, that he told me when I met him was, I crossed the border by my, my own. And then it came up to my mind, this your, your book, Niños Perdidos, and this junior docent. So, and I found this a perfect excuse to have you in, in this, in this exhibit and, and talk about your book and talk about this crisis that is always in need to just inform, uh, people and to let them know what is going on in the border. So welcome, and I, I'm sorry for this, this presentation, but I, I am overexcited to having you in this program. No, on the contrary, Viviana, thank you so much for your generous welcome, and also Sara Linda. Um, thank you everyone for being here. I'm, I'm eager to, to talk and listen, um, especially in these, these new formats when you can't see bodies, it's really important to at least um hear voices and have some some kind of uh, conversation right so i'm going to read um briefly from um from my book tell me how it ends and then i think Viridiana is going to to read that same passage but in in spanish um and then i guess we can talk a little bit later about like the the two versions spanish and english and how they came to be but without uh, more introduction, let me just jump in. If you have the book and want to follow, um, I'm going to start reading from page 55. Um, and sometimes I change things when I read. So if you, if you, if you catch me, you've caught me. Often my daughter asks me, so how does the story of those children end, Ma? I don't know how it ends yet, I usually say. My daughter often follows up on the stories she half hears. There's one story that obsesses her, a story I only tell her in pieces and for which I have not yet been able to offer a real ending. It begins with two girls in the courtroom. They're five and seven years old, and they're from a small village in Guatemala. Spanish is their second language, but the older girl speaks it well. We sit around the mahogany table in the room where the interviews take place and their mother observes from one of the benches in the back. The little girl concentrates on her coloring book, a crayon in her right hand. The older one has her hands crossed as an adult might and she answers my questions one by one. She's a little shy, but tries to be clear and precise in her answers, delivering all of them with a big smile, toothless here and there. Why did you come to the United States? I ask. I don't know. How did you travel here? A man brought us. A coyote? No, a man. Was he nice to you? Yes, I think he was nice. And where did you cross the border? I don't know. Texas, Arizona? Yes, Texas, Arizona. I realize it's impossible to go on with the interview. So I ask the lawyers to make an exception and allow the mother to meet with us, at least for a while. I should say that typically parents or any guardians are not allowed in an interview with a child um, because they, their presence there might modify the answers a child gives. And, and, and these intake questionnaires want the child to be as, um, um, as comfortable to speak the truth as, as they can be in that context. We go back to question number one, and the mother responds for the girls, filling holes, explaining things, and also telling her own version of the story. 
When the younger of her daughters turned two, she decided to migrate north and left them in the care of their grandmother. She crossed two national borders with no documents. She wasn't detained by border patrol and managed to cross the desert with a group of people. After a few weeks, she arrived in Long Island where she had a cousin. That's where she settled. Years passed and the girls grew up. Years passed and she remarried. She had another child. One day, she called her mother, the grandmother of the girls and told her that the time had come she had saved enough money to bring the girls over. I don't know how the grandmother responded to the news of her granddaughter's imminent departure, but she noted the instructions down carefully and later explained them to the two girls. In a few days, a man was going to come for them, a man who would help them get back to their mother. She told them that it would be a long trip, but that he would keep them safe. The man had taken many other girls from their village safely across the two borders to their mothers and everything had gone well. So everything would go well this time too. The day before they left, their grandmother sewed a 10 digit telephone number on the collars of the dress each girl would wear throughout the entire trip. It was a 10 digit number the girls had not been able to memorize as hard as she tried to get them to. So she had decided to embroider it on their dresses and repeat over and over a single instruction. They should never take this dress off, not even to sleep. And as soon as they reached America, as soon as they met the first American policeman, they were to show the inside of the dress's collar to him. He would then dial the number and let them speak to their mother. The rest would follow. And the rest did follow. They made it to the border, were kept in custody in the Yelera, for an indefinite time period. They didn't remember how many days, but they said that they were colder in there than they had ever been before. And after that, they went to a shelter. And a few weeks later, they were put on a plane and flown to JFK, where their mother, baby brother, and stepfather were waiting for them. That's it? My daughter asks. That's it, I tell her. That's how it ends? Yes, that's how it ends. But of course, it doesn't end there. That's just where it begins, with a court summons, the first notice to appear. Thank you. Valeria, solo para confirmar, la versión en español eh, es en casa? Sí. Um, Sí, empieza eh, en casa y es la, la primera frase es algo así como mi hija me pregunta a menudo o algo así. Ok, porque en, en casa una de las primeras personas que entrevista en la corte es un niño hondureño, mm. es la historia de Manu. Ah, no, no está ahí. Es este, la que empieza este, con... ¿Frontera? Eh, Puede ser. Maybe while you look for it, lo, lo importante, eh, Viridiana, es, o sea, empieza con las preguntas de, de la hija, este, preguntando cómo termina la historia. And while, while you look for it, I can, I can just say something about this. Um, the reason why, um, why, why this passage, this fragment ends um, with saying that this is, of course, not where the story ends, but the, where it really begins is um, this book is focused more particularly on the, the labyrinths of the very brutal and violent immigration system in the US, not so much on the journeys of migration from the Northern Triangle through Mexico and to the border, uh, which does, does compose a part of this book. But really this book is a book that I wrote um, in an attempt to understand and shine light, almost like a kind of x-ray of the US immigration system. And when a child receives a notice to appear, uh, that's when the immigration system has issued a deportation order and a kid needs to find a lawyer to defend themselves against deportation. So that's really where the, the 
kind of silent, surreptitious, very taxing, bureaucratic um, journey begins. And that's no less violent, just doesn't make headlines um, as much as uh, the things that happen in the actual geographical border, right? But the institutional violence that begins then is, is what this book is, is about and what it tries to denounce. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you now, Viridiana, you found this section, right? Yeah, it's, me parece que es a menudo mi hija se refiere, ok, bueno, empiezo. A menudo mi hija se refiere a los niños indocumentados como los niños perdidos. Se les olvidan, tal vez, las palabras más difíciles, indocumentado o migrante o refugiado. ¿Y cómo termina la historia de esos niños perdidos? Pregunta. Todavía no sé cómo termina, le digo. Hay una historia que le obsesiona, una historia de la cual solo le cuento algunos fragmentos y para la cual no he podido, y no creo poder, encontrar un final feliz. Empieza con dos niñas en la corte de migración. Tienen cinco y siete años y son de una aldea de Guatemala. El español es su segunda lengua, pero lo más grande, pero la más grande lo habla bien. Estamos sentadas en torno a la mesa de caoba en el cuarto donde se hacen las entrevistas y su mamá está sentada a una de las bancas de la sección trasera del mismo cuarto, apartada de sus hijas. La niña más pequeña está concentrada en un cuaderno de dibujo, empuñando una crayola en la mano derecha. La más grande tiene las manos cruzadas sobre la mesa en actitud adulta y contesta una por una las preguntas que le hago. Responde con timidez, pero hace un esfuerzo por ser precisa y de tanto en tanto remata sus respuestas con una sonrisa enorme y chimuela. ¿Por qué viniste a los Estados Unidos? Eso no sé. ¿Cómo viniste hasta aquí? ¿Nos trajo un señor? ¿Un coyote? No, un señor. Ok, ¿y el señor se portó bien con ustedes? Sí, se portaba bien, yo creo. ¿Y por dónde cruzaron la frontera? Eso no sé. Texas, Arizona. Sí, Texas, Arizona. Es imposible seguir con la entrevista. Me doy cuenta. Así que pido a las abogadas hacer una ex excepción y dejar pasar a la madre para reunirse con nosotras, por lo menos durante un rato. Volvemos a empezar y la madre responde con las niñas rellenando huecos, explicando cosas y contando también su propia versión de la historia. Cuando la menor de sus dos hijas cumplió dos años, decidió dejarlas al cuidado de la abuela e irse a Estados Unidos. Cruzó las dos fronteras nacionales sin documentos. No fue detenida por la migra y pudo cruzar el desierto con un grupo de personas. Después de unas semanas, llegó a Long Island, donde tenía una prima. Ahí se asentó. Pasaron los años. Las niñas crecieron, pasaron los años, se volvió a casar, tuvo otro hijo. Un día le llamó a la abuela de las niñas, su madre, y le dijo que era hora, que por fin había juntado el dinero y las condiciones para hacer traer a sus hijas. No sé cómo acomodó la abuela en su interior la noticia de la partida inminente de sus nietas, pero tomó nota atenta a las instrucciones y se las explicó después a las dos niñas. En unos días iba a venir por ellas un señor, un señor que les iba a ayudar a las dos a llegar hasta donde estaba su mamá. Les dijo que iba a ser un viaje largo, pero les aseguró que no había nada que temer. Ese señor ya había llevado a muchas otras niñas con sus mamás y todo había salido bien. Así que todo iba a salir bien esta vez también. En vísperas de la partida, la noche anterior, la abuela cosió el número de teléfono de la mamá de las niñas en el reverso del cuello de, de sus dos vestidos. Eran dos vestidos buenos, recientes, los únicos que llevarían en el viaje. Era un número de 10 dígitos que las niñas no se, podían, no se habían podido memorizar por más de lo que la abuela trató de que se lo grabaran. Así que decidió bordarlo en los vestidos y les repitió, una y dos y muchas veces, esta única instrucción, nunca se quiten el vestido, ni para dormir, ni para bañarse, nunca. 
y cuando lleguen a la frontera y las encuentre un policía, hay que enseñarle a él el número de teléfono cosido en los vestidos. Ya luego vendría todo lo demás. Vino lo demás. Las niñas estuvieron en custodia del ICE un tiempo indefinido. No se acordaban cuántos días, pero decían que pasaron más fríos ahí que nunca. Más aún que en el invierno que estamos atravesando. Luego estuvieron en un albergue unas semanas y finalmente fueron depositadas por trabajadores voluntarios en un avión rumbo al aeropuerto John F. Kennedy de Nueva York. Ahí las esperaba su madre, su padrastro y su nuevo hermanito. Y ya, preguntó mi hija, y ya, le digo, ¿así termina? Sí, así termina. Pero no, por supuesto que no termina así. Así empezaba apenas con un citatorio de la corte, el proceso legal contra las niñas. Wow. So this is very powerful, Valeria. And right now we have the exhibit border cantos at the Hudson River Museum. And some of the, the pieces that I see there remind me this 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 specific paragraph uh, where the girls have like a stitch of the number. So I want to ask you, and this is a very personal question. How did you feel? How was your like your influence? Because I feel that you're like a, an immig a, a migrant your, almost your whole life has influenced your work writing these two, uh, these two books, the, uh, Tell Me How It Ends and Lost Children. Um, well, thank you for your reading first. The video was fantastic. Um, I mean, I, I indeed have always uh, been on the move, been moved around uh, uh, the world when I was a kid and then um, eventually did not know how to, um, how to be in one place myself and felt very foreign in my own country. So eventually I, I left uh, Mexico when we had already settled back in there. I went to boarding school in India and then I tried to go back to Mexico for university and I did but then I ended up leaving and came to the, U the USA. But uh, I, I arrived in the USA in a very different and very, very privileged circumstance um, because I had won a scholarship to, to, do, to do a PhD to study. And so I arrived with, um, with a visa and I arrived by plane and in, in, no, in no way is that experience com comparable to the experience of many of the people that I've worked very closely with over the years. Um, but I, I am a member of the, of the Latinx community, of the Hispanic community here. And as a Mexican, I feel particularly angry at both Mexico and the USA, both countries in their treatment of, of um, in the way they treat Central American migrants. Mexico plays a, a a terrible role, um, often kind of shadowing the United States and doing kind of dirty work for, for the big brother. And I sort of with that anger, but also with the frustration of, of seeing as a member of, of that community, the absolute invisibility um, of the causes of the Latin community Um, I decided to occupy, as soon as I had spaces, spaces in the radio, spaces in media, spaces in the, in the, in the object that a book is, and then an object that circulates uh, through many minds, I decided to occupy those spaces to give visibility to what often just uh, is given a headline when, when there's a horror story and then is forgotten and not discussed again. And this was, this book was written in the Obama administration, not the Trump administration. And the very um, tricky thing there was that during the Obama administration, everyone was much more relaxed thinking that things weren't so bad. Uh, but in, with, with respect to immigration, things were really, really bad in the Obama administration. And the policies that were started in that administration really laid the ground for the atrocities that also came later. Like Trump administration was of course much worse, 
more cruel, but also more, um, more um, exhibitionist of their cruelty. Uh, so that also led to the um, a much bigger uproar, a much louder response from, from civil society. And a lot more people were simply um, involved in immigration issues during the Trump administration than they were in the Obama administration. But with that book, I was seeking to denounce and give visibility to something that in the Obama administration kept on being pushed to silence and invisibility, right? It was a matter of like few experts, but, but not, you know, there weren't mass demonstrations. There, were, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't this um, uh, civil um, up, uproar. Uh, there wasn't anything, right? There was no support from, from the larger civil society. And that's, that's the reason why I, I, I wrote this book as, as occupying that space as someone, yes, who has, has migrated all her life, but that also occupied a space of privilege and could use that space to, to give visibility. So let, let's contextualize the book because in uh, uh, Los Niños Perdidos, so tell me how it ends is an essay in 40 questions in a period where you were volunteering, uh, being a, a translator to children. Could you talk about more? Yeah, um, I had just applied for a green card. I'd finished um, my studies and mm, my student visa was running out. So um, I had to apply for a green card, but my uh, green card fell into some kind of uh, loophole and, um, and took about two years to, to arrive. And so in, for a period, I had just, I just graduated um, from my program at Columbia and uh, had managed to get a job in Hempstead in, in, a, in Hofstra University teaching Spanish and literature. And, um, but because my green card didn't arrive, uh, I had to give up the job for a while and uh, renounce the job because it was illegal for me to work without a permit. And in that period in which I couldn't work, um, I had already been working in court as a volunteer translator, but I just devoted myself more absolutely, more fully to that work and to writing Tell Me How It Ends. Um, that was 2015. Um, 2015 was a, a very uh, tumultuous year because in the previous year, uh, there had been uh, a very sudden surge of arrivals of Central American children traveling from the Northern Triangle, meaning Guatemala, Honduras, and, and, and Salvador, fundamentally. And uh, just to give you a sense of numbers, between October of 2013 and June, July 2013, around 60,000 children had arrived. And although they had been arriving before that year, this was a, a sudden surge. And so the immigration system and the Obama administration decided to um, call this an immigration crisis, not so much based on the situations that the children were in, but on the capacity of the immigration system supposedly to absorb them and process their cases. And what they did was uh, something pretty cruel, which was to create something called a priority docket, um, which is basically to lump the cases into into one big docket in court and bump it up to priority status so that uh, it, those cases could be seen in court before other cases. That sounds like it's a good thing, but it's not because what it meant in, actual, in actuality was that children who had previously an entire year to find a lawyer to defend them from deportation, now because they were a priority case only had 21 days. So you tell me which child undocumented most probably with an undocumented family is going to find a lawyer to defend them in just 21 days. So um, organizations that previously worked with immigrant communities got together, brainstormed and decided to, to occupy, at least in New York, for example, they occupied a, a courtroom where they would be able to see people coming in to their first um, notice to appear appointment. And they would be able to to uh, conduct an intake questionnaire, basically screen them, understand their cases, and then determine whether their cases were viable and um, whether they could be um, 
taken uh, by a lawyer who would then represent them in defending against deportation. But there was one missing link in all of this, which was uh, the, the Spanish to English translators, right? There weren't, not all lawyers, uh, not all immigration lawyers even are bilingual. And uh, there was a lot of need for people who could act as bridges between the children and potential lawyers. So that's where people like I came in to, to originally just translate, but really because there were so many cases all the time, we ended up um, getting crash courses in immigration um, and conducting the interviews ourselves. There is another section where you just, um, in your book, where you just mentioned another big like character that is Manu. <laughs> And you like make a metaphor regarding that he is just coming from Guatemala in a, a tremendous, horrible uh, environment, violent environment. Then came, he just came, uh, come here to the United States and he's affronting another like uh, face of violence. Could you talk about, about him? It's a very tremendous uh, case that, that, that I found very interesting in your book. Yeah, uh, Manu, who's... Uh whose real name I can now say because now he has a green card finally. So his story ended uh, well. And I, I followed his case all the way through 2015 to the beginning of last year, um, or actually mid last year, because it was in the pandemic where I think we were already in the pandemic where he, or just before the pandemic where he was told that his green card had been approved. But uh, Eric Manu, uh, indeed is, is a teenager or left now he's I guess a, a young adult he left uh, Honduras as a teenager because um, he he had been a target of gangs that were trying to recruit him as many young adolescent boys are and he he had not wanted to to be part of any gang and resisted and what happened to him was what happens to all boys that resist that circumstance, which is that they start getting um, persecuted by these gangs, right? So harassed after school, followed, um, threatened, their families threatened, their family members killed, etc. So he he uh, he resisted for a while uh, until his best friend was killed in front of in front of him, and he 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 knew then that it wasn't this was no game that he had to leave or he or he was going to face the same fate. So he called uh, his aunt um, who, who lived in, lives in, in Hempstead, which is exactly the town where I was, I was working um, in Hofstra University. And she um, agreed to bring him over to the US. And he arrived in the US after a difficult and long journey and was enrolled in school and found in school that um, he was immediately um, uh, in, a, in another kind of gang ecology. And one gang approached him. He didn't want he didn't want to belong to any gang. He was absolutely traumatized by by all of it. And he resisted one. He resisted the other. He ended up getting beat up at school. Um, and he ended up leaving school altogether because he, it was just like an echo of what he had just been fleeing. And he arrived in a country where, where things seemed kind of too eerily similar. Um, and so he was very, he was very depressed for a long time um, and left school and started working. Now, now he's, he's doing well. <laughs> He's what he wants to do is be a he wants to be a rap a rapper. He he loves music, and he was able to record shortly before the pandemic to record his first signal uh, single in a in a professional studio. And he he sent me the song and it's actually pretty good. Um, so I think yeah I mean you know there, that's like one 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 kid whose story I was able to follow uh, from it for several years and that had a. I mean, story goes on, right? He's alive and he's still like, life, life is in front of him still, but, but something, something at least, um, life gave him something back at least. 
I want to ask you how um, how did you complete your research projects? Because I feel that uh, Los Niños Perdidos so tell me how it is is very close to Los Children Archive. And in one section, you have like a the the the, the book Los Children. You have like a very uh, um, a few sections with boxes. And in one box, I found it like super like <gasps> tremendous. Is like uh, in one page you are like mentioning wanted uh, homes for children. And I feel that this is like uh, this migration crisis with uh, in 2014 is not like a just one success, one crisis that is happening right now. The United States has like a tremendous stories of like doing the same with children in, in the last century. Can you tell me something about that? Yeah, I mean, um, definitely. There is a cyclical pattern of violence in, in the United States, not only with respect to children, you know? I mean, the very founding of the country is, is um, is based in, in, in a history of, of, of genocide, disappearance, and deportation, right? In the case of, of the original American, Native Americans, uh, deportation within the same territory, right, to, to reservations. Uh, then with the children of Native Americans, the boarding school systems, right? Um, and and then in, in, you know, in, it's the same thing, for example, with the African-American population, right? I mean, it's, there's a, a line from slavery to segregation to contemporary mass incarceration. There's, there's always a systemic way in which certain populations uh, of certain races, of certain cultures are um, systematically silenced and made invisible by whatever means are legal in that moment. You know, when slavery becomes illegal, then it's Jim Crow. When it's Jane Crow is no longer legal, then it's mass incarceration. And, uh, and the, same, the same is, the same goes for indigenous uh, Americans. And when I say in this case, Americans, I, I mean the inhabitants of our continent. Um, we, we Latin Americans don't call America the country America, we say Estados Unidos because it's kind of absurd to us that we <laughs> are all America, but um, indigenous uh, or the original peoples of the Americas, now many of them migrating north towards the USA, um, are migrating because of extractivist and interventionist politics of the USA in their home countries uh, that began brutal civil wars. A lot of these children uh, that are migrating now come from countries that were brutal inter brutally intervened by the United States and whose social tissue was destroyed since then and that have not yet recovered from those wars, right? So, I mean, it's not only the policies of the US within its own territory, it's the policies of the USA in the Americas. And the result of that is many times immigration but then the, the response to immigration or immig migration to the USA, but then the response in the USA to that is more deportation or more, more mass incarceration in this case, uh, incarceration within detention centers. So yes, I mean, you asked me this, this is a, there's a long history of this, of course, this is a cyclical pattern of violence that, um, that has to this point found no end so you mentioned something about activism. And a few days ago, I was doing a, a tour in the exhibit that we already have. And I was mentioned like some water stations that are like installed in the border. And that remind me that we have like a, a few organizations in the border, but, but also in Mexico. And I mentioned Padre Solalinde, that is a well-known character in Mexico for being a very uh, strong activism. And you mentioned also in your book, Las Patronas, that a woman that they are like just giving food to the people who is traveling in La Bestia, a well-known train that is like the main um, a, a, 
the main drive for the people who are coming from Southern America and something that I mentioned and I am not proud of is like something Central, uh, Central Americans who are crossing to Mexico, the toughest part is Mexico, it's the most violent part of their trip. So can, can you say something about that? Yes, of course. Um, I I think I, I'm I'm going to to um, post a link here in the chat because there's a very great platform um, called Ecologies of Migrant Care, um, and it's um, part of the Hemispheric Institute. <clears throat> and within this Ecologies of Migrant Care. Um, you will find a like a really really good database of um, organizations, not only in the U.S. but in Mexico and Central America, and some of them sort of uh, working in unison, working together in different parts of the migratory, um, different stages of the migratory experience, uh, from 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 the experience of migrating itself. And here here it is. Um, there's that link. I don't know if I'm able to share a screen. Maybe I am. Give me a second so I can maybe just show you very briefly. Um, what's this? Yeah. This is that's Las Patronas, in fact, what we're seeing right there. Do you see my screen? Yes. No. You see that's what that's Las Patronas, indeed, along the roots of La Bestia. But what's really interesting about this, um, this platform is that it, it, it thinks of, of stages in the migratory experience rather than, um, rather than just like in the geography. Or, so we have expulsion, resistance, in transit, refuge, disappearance, deportation, and return, rendering accounts. So for example, there you would find, um, well, my internet's a little bit slow, but Um, you'd find the different people, um, I mean, different organizations, sometimes people, but different different organizations that work together in this particular area, you know, deportation or disappearance. Um, and it's, it's constantly growing. Um, so I, I just really recommend this particular uh, database. It's, it's one that I think is really useful for people who either want to understand the ecology of, of the migration experience, but also for people who want to get involved in any, any possible way. So also that now that we're talking about, about activism, uh, when you were um, teaching Spanish, even in your book, you mentioned that your students create like Latia. What happened with that project? And can you say something about Latia? What is Latia? Yeah, Latia was a really cool project led by my students at Hofstra. Um, I had to teach this course, which, which was supposed to be like advanced conversation in Spanish or something. Like one of those courses that like usually, I don't know if all teachers hate, but I do because it's like, what am I just going to talk about for if there's no like direction? And I had very little experience as a teacher. Then it was my first gig as a teacher after, after graduating. So I was pretty unsure about what to do. And I was obsessed with, with the work in court. Like that's all I could think about. So I decided to ask my students if they were interested in talking about immigration. Um, and I told them a little bit about the work I was doing in the first class. And I told them, so if you don't wanna speak up now, but think about it, write an email to me if you're interested in discussing the subject and, um, and then I'll plan around that. And this won't be an advanced conversation. It will be like a little think tank around this. And all of them wrote to me. It was really um, encouraging. Um, they were all interested in, in learning and discussing this. And so we formed, it was like a little uh, think group or whatever you want to call it. And I, I started teaching them some kind of basics, like from like the geographies and the political context, which like people were coming from the histories of the countries. Um, and then when I realized I had reached the limits of my understanding, I started bringing in experts to talk to them about specific things, lawyers, people that worked in organizations with, um, with undocumented minors. And my students became like re really wonderfully radicalized. Um, I mean, radicalized, like 
pro-immigration advocates. They got really involved. Some of them are lawyers now, which is really cool. Like some of them write to me from their law programs in California or Chicago saying that, telling me about the work they're doing. So th there was something really special happened in that classroom. And um, some at some point in the semester, they they were kind of like bored of just talking theoretically about all this. And they were like, prof, that's it, you know, like, okay, so we think we got it. Now we want to do something about this. And they funded this um, this group that, that they call themselves La Tia, which means auntie in, in Spanish, but but with a with a double I. So it was Teenage Immigrant Integration Association. And they basically the idea was was or the question behind it was like how to find like horizontal ways of integrating uh, high school students that are just arriving in the US undocumented and um, with deportations orders, orders on the back with college students almost the same age who, who are, live in the same town and who can, I don't know, help them find a, a, a kind of organic way of, or an easier path to feeling more welcome in the new society that they live in. It was really cool that they thought about it like that. They weren't like an aid society. They weren't like, oh, we're gonna go teach these kids something and teach them English. And like, there wasn't that kind of hierarchical view. My students were very clear about how, how they wanted to, how they wanted to basically welcome new people into the town that they were arriving, right? So we went to the high schools, the flyers. It was very, I had never done anything like that. We were just trying things out. And uh, kids started like getting interested, calling us, we made WhatsApp groups, we made, and um, the idea was they, that they would talk English and Spanish, so together, but really what really what actually worked was not the uh, like language classes so much, it was just like soccer games. <laughs> that was really what everyone wanted to do. Um, so we organized a lot of soccer matches basically. And then that, that, that brought about like other lovely things, like more, just more like um, just real relationships between the university students I was teaching and the high school students in the town. And I mean, they ended up, um, for example, Manu, Eric, the first time he recorded a song of his, not in a professional studio, but almost, was with some students of mine who were uh, journalism majors and had access to a recording studio where there was like the, the radio station of the college. And it was, it was thanks to them you know, that he was able to go into a studio for the first time and record a song with them and have like a, an interaction with the studio space, right? It made it possible for him. And then, then he, he took next steps and found a real recording studio to record his first song. So there was something very cool there. And I mean, I just think that that's, um how how integration can start happening right like how it, it's really it has to be something very horizontal and between people of, of a similar age they're not the same age that really can understand uh the other's experiences much much better than than as adults can okay so I just want to invite the audience if they want to ask you something. I I, I, I would love to just keep asking you things, <laughs> but I, I just want to open the conversation to the people who are joining us today. So feel free to open your microphone if you want to make a question or you, you can just type it in the chat and I can read it for Valeria. Y también la podemos hacer en español. So Valeria habla también español, si quieres hacer una pregunta en español. I see that I have a few junior docents, some of my kids that I, I, I just trained at the museum. So feel free to open your microphone and say something. So we have a question is, what new projects are you working on now? I'm, I'm muted. Uh, well, I'm working on several things right now at the same time, but um, one very central project uh, for me right now that has like has my almost undivided attention is um, is a uh, something that we're calling for now a sonic essay. It's like a sound piece. Um, 
but it's not just sound, it's, it's um, narrative as well. And the narrative explores the history of violence against land and against the female body in the US-Mexico borderlands um, from about the mid 19th century when the border was being drawn with the shape it has today till the present day. Um, but it is also a, a, like a, a, a sonic essay because we uh, are recording or meticulously recording sounds in the border regions, both uh, like recording sounds of today um, and everything from like the sound of a saguaro thorn to the sound of wind in the Tirikawa mountains to the sound of uh, conversation with the migra uh, but also we are um, working with archival recordings that in one way or the other document the history of, of violence in the region. So from braceros and agricultores in California to um, a group of women in the 1970s that, um, um, I don't know if you've heard of the case Madrigal versus Quilligan, but it was 10 Chicana women who were illegally sterilized by a doctor in LA and then um, organized a class action suit against that doctor for having illegally sterilized them. They lost the case, unfortunately, un in incomprehensibly. But, um, but there are a series of tapes of them um, that uh, a really interesting anthropologist, a Chicano anthropologist, uh, recorded in conversation with them as they were trying to put the case together. But it's a really powerful document of the history of obstetric and reproductive violence against Latina women in this country. Um, so so we, we also incorporate archival recordings. It's a very, it's a complex piece. It's very long, it's 24 hours, um, which is the amount of time it takes to drive. If you drive in a straight line from Tijuana, San Diego to Texas, Brown, Brownsville, so from ocean to ocean, it's 24 hours. So this is a 24 hour sound piece documenting the many layers of, of histories of violence in, in, in the region that divides or, or brings together these two countries. Thank you. And I have another question and probably it's connected to the one that Cindy Stewart just wrote in the chat. But it's regarding the the your work as a woman because me and you like Mexican we understand the violence in a different way than the, the, the Americans, especially because right now we're having a huge conversation, a, a very feminist conversation in Mexico, and to stop the violence against women. So um, I just want to just mention this, and you can just complete the the, the, the question that we have uh, in the chat. You write both fiction and non-fictions, and and in at least English and Spanish, how do you decide what ideas you want to explore in what format and language? Um, yes, Cindy, thanks for that question. It's really it's really a good question. Um, it's it's really hard for me to decide. It takes me ages. Um, I am. In general, whenever I'm presented with two options, I can just like oscillate like a pendulum between one and the other without knowing which one's right. You know, uh, <laughs> like, yeah, yellow or green or yes or no or fiction on fiction, like it's Spanish or English. And it takes me a really long time to exit the, um, the very weird space that my mind enters when I'm presented with two possibilities. And what I have to do basically is to just journal uh, and read and write for a very long time in both languages and trying out forms until I've spent enough time with the material and with those questions that um, I find a way. And there's, this is, I know this is not helpful, but I guess what, the, what can be helpful is to say that it's, it's just about patience and dedication to the material. Uh, eventually it reveals itself to me, but it takes me really, really a long time. Um, I can't impose a language on anything I've written or anything I will write, just as I cannot impose a form and then try to fit content into a form, you know, that would be like um, 
not only really boring exercise for me, but also just impossible. You know, if I have to think of like chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, I just don't, I just don't want to do it. I have to think of, um, think of a form that's flexible enough to, to be malleable and, and change over time and eventually uh, find a, a given shape. But it, 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 it takes time and it takes like intuition and trusting intuition um, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Valeria. So does anybody else wants to make a question? Well, I, I was starting to type my question, but it, it got a little bit out of hand. It got a little bit long. Um, and I hope I can express uh, my question, um, which, which starts with my um, observation of your imagery. Um, I found in, in Lost Children Archive in particular, your imagery is so impactful and so unforgettable in, in the way it resonates the vast emptiness and silence of the desert. And just thinking about it, it's just, I, I have these images that, that are really unforgettable. And, and it really calls to mind the photographs of Richard Mizrach and the sounds of Guillermo Galindo that we have in the museum now um, with Sonic, uh, with um, Border Canto's Sonic Border. Without giving too much away, <laughs> I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about your practice, about your writing practice, and how you create these incredibly powerful and emotional laden images. Couldn't type it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, practice and craft are to me a very mysterious thing. The, um, um, because I, I didn't go to school for writing. I didn't study an MFA program. So I wasn't taught like a series of pos possible forms, procedures. I studied uh, philosophy in Mexico City and then um, literature, uh, but comparative literature, not, not writing. Um, so for me, it's always been like the, the question I ask myself at the beginning of any project is like, how the hell am I going to do this? It's like, it's like I've forgotten everything I'd learned from the previous one. And it's like, and now, now what the hell do I do? Like, I just don't know how to do this. And but then it seems to me like at the end of every project, when it's finished, I look back and I, and I ask myself almost the same question, which is like, how the hell did I do this? <laughs> I don't know how I got here. No, it's, um, so I, I think for me, it's like a, always a matter of not, um, because I'm not working with any kind of blueprint, I have to um, have a very, like a very serious conversation or very playful sometimes, but very dedicated always conversation with the archive that I'm uh, looking at in order to write, right? And I usually write about things that I'm very curious about, but I don't know so much about. So I need to educate myself on them for a long, long time and look at a lot of primary sources and listen to old interviews and um, read weird books and pamphlets and correspondence between, like, it's, it's just like a, a like a, it's really more the task of yeah of a of, um, of researcher or of an archivist, um, and only when I begin to have some more like a sense of familiarity with it do I begin like trying out um, not voices but like gazes you know like tones like m forms of like bringing disparate things together in the same page. Um, and, and then, yeah, and then it's like, then it's like sewing, then it's like piecing together, then it's like, uh, going back to the sources and coming back to write and then like under like pick, picking up like a line or, or some, something from, from something I read and then trying to, to juxtapose it to something very different and putting it together on the page. So it's, as I said earlier, for me, like a very, like a very sometimes frustrating, but also very fun process because I'm not following any rules and um, 
it's like uh, my very nerdy way of, of being rebellious, you know, not doing anything wrong. It's just a hyper nerdy way of, of feeling like I'm breaking the rules, you know, and just having fun with, with not knowing. Thank you so much. I don't think anybody would think of you as a nerd, but, but that's <laughs> okay. Vidi, <laughs> I think we have another question. Yes, Jamie Banks just uh, was asking regarding uh, do you know how the 24 hour sonic SAPs you mentioned it earlier will be accessible to audiences and in what language? Um, yeah, we're thinking about the different uh, final forms it can have. And um, one possibility is that it's just like a sound installation. Um, and we're in conversation with the DIA Museum uh, in Beacon who might be supporting uh us at least part of part of work that we're doing and but my the, the like the the I, I like the idea of an installation that can like a, just a sonic installation that people can walk into and and experience part of but the way i see it the ideal way for me is um that it's it's just an mp3 file that you can listen to in situ and if you are like um one type of nerd like you can like plan to drive the 24 hours, of course, not in one go, but um, to drive the length of the border in chunks, listening to the corresponding uh, pieces of the sonic essay. So you'll drive, I don't know, three hours in Arizona and we'll listen to, to, to three hours that are composed thinking about that particular length of the border and so on and so forth. But it, since, since the idea is that it's, a, it's an MP3 file, I think it can also be listened to in a high school in Japan or, or in a living room in, in Cape Town. You know, it's, the idea is that it has that flexibility and we were, we're going to publish with the, the Sonic essay a kind of series of little chapbooks, probably 24 chapbooks with the text, the textual component of them. Um, yeah, that's kind of where we are. There's, there's some other ideas, but that's, and then the language, um, I think it'll be primarily Spanish and English, but with presence of, um, of Native American languages from both sides of the border in the, in the regions, um, I mean, languages that are spoken in that particular region still today, um, but primarily English and Spanish, and I'm not sure yet in, in what percentage of equilibrium if it's going to be very, again, it's like the question that um, Cindy was asking. I'm still not sure. We're st I'm still, I'm, it's, it's in um, early stages. And some of the pieces I've written are in Spanish, some are in English. We'll see how they, how they find some kind of balance. We have a comment from uh, Liz Rodriguez. Thank you for mentioning the history of U.S. intervention in Latin America and how it was it has contributed to the immigration issues that exist today. Also, tracing these issues all the way back to slavery, touching on the 1619 project. Gracias. So I think we're closing. We're almost close to end the the session, but I want to make sure that if anybody else has. Um, any other question, comment, feel free to open your microphone or type it in the chat box. And also one part of your book that I, I just mentioned at the beginning before we start the, the meeting, uh, in one part of uh, the Niños Partidos, you, I have a favorite page that uh, you just, I feel is uh, one conclusion that I feel really important to just, just mention because um, my question it will be to end up this, this session is why we should tell these stories of these children and you conclude in the page 32 uh, about it but I just want to mention and I this is a comment <laughs> I won't read it but I, I think I, I think it's important to just say it why is important to just tell the stories of the, these children who are crossing the border with, without any any parent hmm. are you asking me or are you gonna read i i am asking you <laughs> i mean i think that you know like stories are never a final version of anything right they're just kind of like 
narrative layers that we have as communities. Um, and it is thanks to these like narrative layers that we share um, that the story can continue to develop, right? Uh, it's like the, the common ground that we have in order to, um, to refute each other, to build upon each other's ideas, to, to dissent, um, to invent, to imagine. And the, this particular generation, this diaspora of children and teenagers is eventually gonna be um, adults. They're eventually gonna grow up and many of them will be, uh, hopefully many of them will be able to write their own stories, the story of their generation write plays, um, do stand up, uh, poetry, uh, whatever they do, right? Whatever this future generation does. But um, I think in the meantime, those of us who um, have witnessed from different angles, from different perspectives, what this has been, um, I think have the duty to leave behind that one little layer of narrative uh, that then that generation can go back to uh, as an archive and say, oh, she was really wrong about this, but this was important. And yeah, I'm going to take this on. Oh my God, this story was very similar to mine. And I'm, you know, it helps me think about this. And so I think that's, that's always what is important in, in narratives. I, I always, um, whenever I speak to lawyers, I give a lot of um, conferences and chat, like talks, public talks, to lawyers and medical practitioners for some reason. I've always asked to, to visit the two guilds and they often ask me what to do uh, or how they can, how they can, what they can do within their own fields because sometimes their margins of, of, of actual activism are very narrow because they have to comply to, to systems and, um, and keep their jobs and can't, can't can't be very radical with what they do. But what I tell them is just document everything you see. You know, you might not be able to, to change the system in which we live, but, but you can document what you're seeing and leave behind that very valuable observation, that archive of what you see in, in hospitals where undocumented women are being uh, treated and mistreated. So I think, yeah, I think it is our obligation, whoever's close in whatever capacity to all this to document. And I'm gonna have to go now <laughs> because I, I have a little girl who's hungry and I have to take her to dinner. Um, Thank but you so much for just joining. And I have a, a last um, comment from uh, Jamie Banks. I, I know we're a little bit over time. Just, I, I just wanna read and I think we already answered this question, but I'm going to read it anyway. So sorry to monopolize the comments, but I just love the lost children. Can you possibly comment on how you capture the dialogue between the parents and children in lost uh, children so sensitive, sensitive and respectfully? I just love that aspect of the work. Well, thank you, Jamie. And I mean, how just listening to other people speak, <laughs> uh, trying to, yeah, to be true to how people actually communicate. Um, but thank you for your comments and thank you all for your time. Uh, Balea, thank you so much for, for giving us so much of yourself this evening. Uh, I wanna thank my colleagues, um, particular Viri, and also Luis and Olivia. And um, I invite everyone to go to our calendar to see other uh, really important events that are coming up uh, in conjunction with our exhibition. But once again, thank you for, um, for bringing so much of yourself to us this evening, Valeria. Go have a wonderful dinner and um, good luck in everything. And everyone be well and thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.